gives his gives his spiel for the night. <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me? Okay. I have about nine of you on video, so I'm assuming those of you are shaking your head, you can hear me. Okay. My name is Sina Mathien. I'm a uh, board certified general surgeon. Um, I am chief of surgery at one of the Baylor facilities in uh, the Dallas Fort Worth area. I've been a general surgeon now for um, in practice uh, for 22 years. Um, what do you guys want to hear? You want to hear how I got here? All right, don't shake your head. At rule number one, the answer is a yes or no. You're dealing with a surgeon. So you either say yes or no. I need to hear you, and you're going to learn that when you're a resident. They're going to look at you in your face. It's going to be old guys like me. They're going to stare right into your face, and they expect an answer. Can you hear? Can you want to hear how I got here? Yes. yes. All right. Yes. yes. All right, so I, I went to high school in Virginia, Southeastern Virginia. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, I was good at science. I was good I was at, good at uh, uh, say that again. Okay. Am I echoing you guys? Is that it? Anyway, so I. Uh, I, think, I think somebody just unmuted. So that'll happen if somebody unmutes themselves by accident. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so I went to college uh, with plans of uh, becoming a biologist, not really knowing what to do. Um, I kind of actually graduated with a biology degree and I couldn't get a job. So I went straight to grad school. And when I was in grad school is when I decided uh, to, um, you know, kind of go to medical school. So I started a little bit late. Uh, I, I while I was in grad school, I started taking pre-med classes and also uh, getting ready for the MCATs. And uh, I actually took the MCATs one time just on a fly, realized that I needed to get prepared for it. It was kind of an embarrassing experience. And then I took the MCATs a second time and I did okay. I didn't apply to many schools because I just didn't have the financial opportunity. I applied to in-state schools at the time. And I got into the in-state school in Virginia. So I'm a, I'm a grad, I went to med school at the Medical College of Virginia. It was now called Virginia Commonwealth University Medical College of Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. Um, I went in with the thought of, uh, um, um, actually, at first, at first I thought, you know, I'm a little bit older. I had gone to grad school. I spent a couple of years after after college trying to get into med school. So I decided I was thinking at the time I was going to go into family practice. And then, you know, I probably, probably they told you when you say you want to do primary care, they love you. They kind of and, and they kind of entice you into school. And I kind of did that. You know, I thought of doing it that way. I ended up uh, when I was in med school, kind of uh, scoping out different medical practices, spending time with family physicians, liking some, not liking others. Uh, you do some of that, uh, depending what the med schools you go to, depending what kind of program they have. Hold on for me, excuse me. Um, depending on the kind of programs they have, sometimes you get experience during your first or second year. Mine was a very traditional program. We didn't leave the classroom the first year. Second year, we got some experience outside, but it was nothing like our third year. It was during third year and during my surgical rotation that I kind of realized this was my calling. And every, every one of my classmates who was in, cl in my rotation uh, knew it. They told me, they go, you need to be one of these guys. They're an asshole. You're an asshole. You fit right in. So I kind of decided that I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, and ba basically barely in time, barely in time to get ready to do my uh, uh, end of third year, beginning of fourth year, what's they call externships trying to get to know some surgical programs and then getting ready for the match. I actually, I think it was maybe a few hours before the deadline of the match, I had to decide between surgery, general surgery, uh, or family medicine. And then, uh, believe it or not, one of my family practice advisors just looked at me and he goes, you need to do what you like or you're not gonna be happy. So I decided to go to surgery. I matched in Galveston, Texas at the University of Texas Medical Branch, was my second choice. Um, spent seven years there doing my residency. 
seven years, which, which if you talk to my wife who met me my first year and we did not get along until my fifth year, uh, she'll tell you they're, they're incredible years. The most uh, amazing learning experience that you will do. I mean, I get, I get emotional about my residency. And you guys, I know you're thinking, oh, med school. Can't wait to get into med school. It is your residency that makes you. It's the residency who makes who you will be. It is residency which gives you confidence to invade people's bodies and we have confidence to put them back together and confidence to go home at the end of the day and feel good about what you did. So seven years for me in Galveston and then an extra year of fellowship at uh, Methodist in Houston. And I tried, I went to academic practice for about a year and I, at the same time, just kind of naturally ended up into private practice. So I have my own practice, I have partners, but I work at the major facility and I got into administrative stuff, like I'm chief of surgery, I'm director of surgical services, stuff like that that comes along. As you get along, you get older to do that. But uh, I, I talk to pre-med students. I actually have I, I, pre-med students rotate with me, and I have uh, medical students rotate with me. We don't have a residency program, um, but the uh, residency is significantly more intricate, more, more complex than anything else. So the getting into med school is just really the first step. Is is hard because um, I used to teach a class and I used to tell people when you go to college, about 20% of you will not make it. College designed for 20% is a curve, right? There's a curve. There's a curve. More than half are going to be in the center to getting C's and they're making it through and they're going to graduate. There's 25% who are going to be superior. They're going to get A's and get great, you know, careers. And there's 25% that's not going to make it. There is no there is no curve in med school. You will make it. They will make you make it. Very few people fail med school. You're if you're they're the, that's the guy you don't get to see anymore. You're like, hey, what happened to that guy? He used to sit next to me, and he won't be there after the first year, or they quit because third year is is brutal. Um, but is residency where you see people disappear? There were five of us starting my surgical residency. Two of us finished because it was brutal. And I know how people talk about it being brutal, but is is um, is a learning experience that is irreplaceable. There is a, is a learning experience that is is incredible. I was up nights. There were days that I stayed up like two or three days in a row. And I remember getting barely in sleep. I remember going buying underwear because I couldn't wash them anymore. I just decided that I was going to buy underwear and just get a new one every time I needed one because washing was a joke. Um, I would forget to dry them. It is, it's crazy. But, the, you know, I ended up doing, by the time I finished my seventh year, I had about 1,700 major procedures under my belt. Uh, and that's major procedures. So appendix, gallbladders, they don't count. They're not even considered major. And so you have to get ready to sit for your board. That's another th step. Uh, once you finish your residency, you have to sit for your boards. And the boards are different for each specialty. Did, they, did you guys know how the boards work? Did anybody explain to you how the boards work? Okay. So first year of med school, you finish your first year. You do the part one of the national boards. It's called the National uh, Board of Medical Examiners. It's essentially everything you learn first year in, in, a med, in med school, which is basic science all the benign stuff, nothing diseased. Once you finish your second year, you do part two with the National Board of Medical Examiners. That's gonna be all the malignant stuff, all the bad stuff. Everything you learned the first year, now all the stuff that's abnormal. Once you end up in an internship, which is your first year of residency is required for you to do an internship. And it could be something that's not necessarily in your specialty, but it's, there are only certain internships you can have. Once you finish your internship, you take part three. Part three of the National Board of Medical Examiners is given in certain places in the country, uh, usually about June, July, at the end of your internship, or maybe May, I think, maybe it's May. Once you do that, you will get a license from the National Board of Medical Examiners, a little plaque you get. It says you're now graduated from National Board of Medical Examiners, which means nothing. It's, just, it's, just, it's just a step you have to take, but it doesn't allow you to do squat. 
um, it does allow you to come out, get actually a state license to practice. And depending on the state you're in. So each state has its own rules. Each state has its own state rules, how they manage things. So, but then it allows you to get into residency, get a license to practice, maybe what they call moonlight, which is kind of work at nights, making extra money. Depending on the residency you're in, you may have time. Uh, some residencies have time, some have absolutely no time. And then once you finish your residency, you have to sit for your specialty board. And they are different by specialty. Some are right away. As soon as you finish your residency and you have qualified uh, during your test, during your residency, you get what's called in-service exams. So besides having to work 48 hours a day, you end up having to actually study for boards. And every year you get a test and it's called the in-service exams. As long as you've done your in-service and you've done your cases, you have done, you submitted your hours, your residency program actually does that. They, they submit everything to the to that board, then you qualify for the boards. You're called board eligible. Board eligible means that you can sit for your boards. And they are, each, each specialty is different. Some have just written, some have written and orals. If you guys watch Grey's Anatomy, my kids were watching it, they're like, oh my God, the orals really like that? Yeah, I actually threw up between room one and room two. Um, I, I vomited all my breakfast. So. Uh, and if the, I, I think I failed this room two. I think I got room one and three right, but room two, I, I, everybody died in that room. Um, but then you get your boards. Now you are specialized. Now you can actually work within your specialty at the facilities, hospitals, clinics. Insurance companies will give you insurance payments that cover you. Uh, and then every few years, you have to retake the boards. And there are different types. Some are just an exam. I'm about to take my boards for the second time, third time uh, this year, but it's mostly just a written test with, um, I have to submit my cases, I have to submit uh, 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 continuing educational credits, stuff like that. But you're expected to stay on top of things, you're expected to know things and keep being educated. So, but it's, it's not as hard as it sounds, it's really not that hard. So it's extremely long road, um, sometimes, uh, you know, you sit there and you think about it. You're like, oh my God, my friends went to college, then they went into business. Now they own a Porsche and they look so good in their 20s driving you know, fancy cars. But the, the, the one thing that I have, they can't have. I have a license to practice medicine. And that's just something that is irreplaceable. It gives you a sense of pride. But I've also heard it from a judge one time. The judge told me, and this is not a bad thing. It was a good thing. I didn't see the judge because it was a bad thing. It was a good thing. And he told me, he goes, you are held to a higher standard. Because I was like, why am I getting called for stuff like that? So he told me, he goes, you are held to a higher standard. So if you're going to do this, you will be held to a higher standard that nobody else would understand. You will be responsible for people's lives and their deaths. And you have to understand that. You have to come to terms with that. And it's okay. If you don't want to do it, it's okay, you know. Uh, but if you're going to do it, you got to come to terms with that. Um, I think I've said enough. So I'm going to let you guys ask questions. If you want to hear anything else, I'd be happy to tell you. Not all at once, though, because I can't handle social media. I'll go first. Um, what do you think is the most important thing? to balance your family life and your work life or while you're going through med school balancing like not losing your mind from not having a social life and trying to balance that with school it's a really good question you hear that a lot people choosing not to do medicine because they're so worried about social life or uh, you know if you're a woman how do i have a family and how do i raise a family and how i do that um you know, I I was fairly lucky. I kind of went day by day enjoying. I had a great time in med school. I probably should have been arrested a few times. Um, a residency was a blowout too. I mean, I, I we worked we worked three four days in a row, and then when they let us out, we lost it. And this is an interesting place. I was in Galveston, which is a 
uh, 15 miles wide, four, sorry, 15 miles long, four miles wide, but it's got a thousand bed hospital. The University of Texas Medical Branch. It's a crazy program. You really don't have anywhere to go when you come out. The thing is that, it's just, and I have a lot of friends that have families and I have friends that had kids. And um, I had a, the top students in my class, medical school, were a husband and wife team who actually went to divinity school before they decided to go to med school. So you don't have to be a science major to get in med school as long as you get the prerequisites and you do good on your MCATs and other things. And then they ended up um, matching together and they had family. So I think you can balance it. You have to be realistic. You're not going to um, be a neurosurgeon and try to raise a set of twins. A man or a girl or a guy, or a guy doesn't, it's hard. But the I have... I've been able to raise a family. I've been able to create a life for myself. I am behind compared to my peers because I went to med school. Um, I didn't have an income really until I was about 35. If you guys, you guys got friends that are, uh, you know, coming out of college and making a living four times what you're going to make. You got patients, you got people that go to nursing school. Think about it. Nurses make more in their lifetime than you will. Because they start making good money about 22, 23, and they have a career. Um, it is a tough balance, is, but I wouldn't replace it. I, uh, I, I love what I do. And people that work with me, they'll tell you that. They go, he, he loves what he does. Um, I'm not sure, did I miss something? Did I miss part of my family life? Did I miss? I did miss my young, my kids were young. I did miss some of their quality time when they were little. Um, you wouldn't know it now, but uh, I'm sure my wife will remind me every once in a while that I miss a few things. Um, but at the same time, I'm a, I have no regrets in my career, in my life. It, it's a decision you have to make. It's not, it's not an easy decision. Um, but again, this is a lifetime choice. You have, if you want to do this, you'll pay the price. You don't have to be a hermit, though. You, you don't have to be a weirdo. You can be normal. Most of us are normal. Not everyone. Most of us. All right. What else you guys got? Bring it on. Um, I have a question. Uh, they, sure. they place so much emphasis on MCAT, obviously, and especially trying to do it right the first time. Um, how did you go about finding the best way to study for that? And like, kind of what process did you follow to find maybe a program or just whatever way was going to help you perform the best. So you're you're talking about some sometime around 1985 when I did this. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a long time, but I uh, biggest mistake I think I made was taking it unprepared, and then realizing how hard it was. I mean, I didn't remember by that time I already had my master's in biochemistry, and I thought to myself, eh, how hard could that be? It wasn't the basic stuff that got me. It was this basically the logics the logistical stuff that drives you crazy. Um, what I ended up doing is, um, I, I don't remember the name of the course, but I took a course, I think it was called Kaplan, maybe still around, um, and then just spending time uh, going through the Kaplan books and going through the, you know, just kind of preparing myself. It took me about a few months to finally realize that this test wasn't about basic knowledge. That the test was really to weed the 25% away. That 25% curve that is in college. You think about when you guys were freshmen in college, how many of people did not show up next year? That's what that test is designed to do. Um, I, you know, and as not, I don't, you want to do well the first time, but I don't see anything wrong with doing, trying it again the second time. But at the end of the day, believe it or not, it's hard to get into med school, but as many people get into med school, Physicians retire or die. So there's always a need. There always will be a need for physicians. Um, the one thing that is key is, like I said, that the top two class, the two people in my class at the time when I went to med school were husband and wife. And they were they came out of divinity school. I mean, they weren't even, I don't even think, I don't know if that was a real college. They had a college degree, but it was, so they were really good at studying. And they had study skills, which I had to learn. The one thing that was crazy, I was a biochem major. I had a master's in biochem. 
they did the entire two years of master level biochemistry in six weeks in med school, six weeks. I decided that I could not drink that week, those six weeks, because it went by so fast. And I almost did not pass the test. It was, uh, it was like, holy cow, that was one hard as shit test. <laughs> but uh, the, then I learned that, yeah, you know, they go through stuff so fast in med school that it's just, there's no time. So the best thing you can do is to practice, 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 taking the, you know, the same, I forgot, they, this practice test you can get. So you can get the concept of answering those questions, the logistical questions quickly. The other thing I was gonna tell you is funny, I, I never thought about this. How many of you guys are taking like weird classes in college, like comparative anatomy? Anybody doing that yet? You're doing comparative anatomy? Yeah, as you, embryology, anybody doing embryology? Isn't it a weird shit? It's like, what the hell? What do I need to learn about eggs and chicks? Believe it or not, it's gonna come back at you. I operate on diseases that are embryologically originated. There are ENTs out there that take gills out of people's faces. So all of that stuff comes right back at you. Biochemistry every day. I have to decide what drugs to give, how they work, the counter reactions, the reactions, physiology, like crazy. So believe it or not, all that stuff is kind of useful. And obviously like microbiology and virology, all that stuff comes back. All right. You guys let me know. You can... Go ahead. I don't believe you can see the chat, so I'll read this question for you. Um, okay. Somebody, asked, well, Blaine asked, what does a, a typical day shift look like for you as a general surgeon? Oh, so in private practice, it's a little different than a, a residency. So I can tell you what it's like as a private practice. I set my schedule most of the time. I have a staff that sets my schedule. There are days that I operate and days that I go to clinic. Um, there are guys that have different schedules. Some like to mix every day with surgeries and clinic. I kind of like to keep them separate. So uh, if I have inpatients, that means I have people in the hospital. I usually like to round on them first in the morning. Uh, so about uh, seven o'clock, I'm in the hospital. I make my rounds fairly quickly. I try to get a bite to eat. I start my clinics about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. I'm in clinic. Uh, I go through clinic to about lunch. Then if I have to have any kind of small surgeries or something, I add them on. And then I come back for more clinic in the afternoon. And that clinic ends about 5, 5.30. And then I either go home, go work out, uh, or, uh, you know, if I have add-on surgery, I go to surgery. As a general surgeon, you are trained to operate day and night, any time of the day and night. And you, you have to triage people. So you learn who's important, who can wait, who cannot wait. Uh, it's different in every specialty. Um, but it's part of your kind of process. As a matter of fact, it's, it's like taking the MCATs every day. You sit there and you think about, okay, who goes first, who goes second, who goes third? And then there are days that I have surgeries only. I start my morning in the operating room. I come in, I check on the patients, the staff gets ready, we go back to surgery. And as a surgeon, you are the captain of the ship. So whatever, however you behave and how you behave, how your day goes determines the rest of the day in that room or rooms. Um, some days I'm done by noon. I mean, like this Tuesday, uh, Tuesday I saw I have four cases. I'd be done by one o'clock. I'll probably get some paperwork done. I may go work out. I may, you know, do something else, go to the clinic. My day will end early, but I may end up staying and helping. The, I have partners. Sometimes they have add-on cases or sick people that need to be seen. So we kind of talk to each other all day and I may do some other stuff in the afternoon. It's hard for me to sit still. I'll figure something. I figure somebody needs to be cut. I'll, I'll find them. I'm trying to find out what your chat thing is, but I, but I don't see the questions. So you guys can read the questions for me. Hello, Dr. Martin. M Martin. It's all right, man. I had a, I had a question about um, how often or is it common for physicians to have a private practice or to have another job that's outside of um, their regular hospital work. And are these things they do in order to like cope with debt from medical school or are these things they do in or just for like 
um, just as a hobby? Uh, so you you got questions that go in multiple dimensions. So I'll try to answer most of them. Um, private practice, what they call private practice, is probably um, kind of dying away. Um, the is, this is old. This is old school. We're old. Most physicians or most residents graduating residencies now, they tend to join either big groups or be hired by hospital systems or by systems. It's just easier that way. Um, you get a little bit of control over your life. And I think that's more young people prefer that. I didn't have much of a choice. Private practice is like opening up your own bakery. You literally have to figure out how you're going to buy the dough. How are you going to mix the bread and how are you going to sell the bread? It's a good sense of independence. I love it because it's mine. It's all mine. I know it sounds possessive, but it's like having your own truck. It's your truck. Nobody can take your truck away. But there's a lot of headache that goes with it. So I, I, my feeling that most of you guys will be joining big practices or uh, systems, hospital systems. And some states have weird rules. They won't allow hospitals to hire doctors. It's like the state of Texas, state of California. You have to be hired by system entities. Um, and they will determine your salary. Some of them are fixed salaries. Some of them are production-based salaries. And so you, have, you will learn all this stuff as time goes. Many, uh, most people will come out with a huge amount of debt. The debt is kind of burdening a little bit. It does uh, stay with you a little bit. You can't constantly worry about it. The Having the ability to work extra hours or what they call moonlighting. Moonlighting is uh, uh, working somewhere else at night, like running the ER. I did a little bit of it. Moonlighting is an option. You go make some money. Um, depends on your specialty. If you are family medicine specialty, you can moonlight day and night because you only work in clinic. You have very few responsibilities outside the clinic or inside the hospital. As family physician, you do have to come to the hospital, learn to deliver babies, and you have to learn to take care of babies. But otherwise, you're in clinic eight to five. Uh, you may have some weekend clinics. If you're doing orthopedic surgery, urology, general surgery, you're not going to have the extra time to do much of anything. You're going to just sleep when they tell you. Um, so there are options out there to pay for med school, pay by med school. My biggest advice to you guys for med school is when you decide to go to med school, you get into med school, you're so excited that you literally go out there and you start borrowing money because they'll give it to you. Those entities love to let you guys have money. And then what you do is a little bit different, so just kind of bear with me. I, I, mean, I got my that money and I bought a big old stereo, the biggest speakers you could buy. I was bad. It was so cool having all that stuff. Uh, don't don't waste your money on anything because that stereo right now probably cost me a house because it took me 10 years to pay it back. But so borrow the minimum amount of money. And then when you be going to a residency, pay the interest every month. You will get paid as residents. You do have an income. During that income, that time, if you can, pay the interest. During residency, most people defer paying their medical school loans. Deferring means, hey, look, I'm in residency. I can't really afford it. They'll defer it. They'll wait until you finish your residency to actually start making payments. The problem is during that period of residency, interest is adding to your medical school loans. So if you can just pay interest during your residency, you will end up not having a huge burden on you. But like you said, coming out, worrying about the debt. Um, the thing about it, like I said, when you finish your college and you go to med school, live just like you did when you were a freshman in high school, in college. Don't go crazy. Uh, you do have to have a little bit more privacy than a freshman in college. You have to have quiet and time to study and time to, you know, to concentrate, but borrow the minimum amount and pay the interest back during your residency. So you don't end up with a huge burden, but there's plenty of places and times that you can do extra work Moonlight. I used to do um, when they had transplants when I was a resident, and there was a transplant. What they we used to call it harvest, but it's, it's kind of inappropriate. It's called uh, tissue acquisition. 
um, I would go help. I would go help in the operating room, and uh, I made good money. Man, they used to give me good money to help. It's a little brutal, but you you kind of operated and you made extra cash. Okay, is that a good answer, or you want more? Yes, that was good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question for Cameron from the chat. Um, do you have any regrets or anything that you wish you would have done differently throughout your time and everything? Um, I think the only, I think the only thing I would say that I had regrets on, I wish I would have was a better student my freshman and sophomore year in college. I, I spent a lot of time doing kind of useless stuff, but I didn't, I probably, it's a good thing that I did because I, wouldn't be here, I don't think. So I think my only issue was my time, the time that I took to, to make a decision to do this. I wish I would have started sooner, um, but it's not a major regret. As far as career decisions, I don't regret anything I've done. I love what I do. And, I, and, and once you guys do your rotations, you, you will be physicians. You make rotation with physicians that you learn from how, I mean, that was the reason I decided to do surgery. My chief resident, uh, in, in medical school, my third year rotation in surgery, he was the main reason I decided to surgery. He was an asshole. He was brutal. He was mean. He was tough. But I still love the guy. It's just the way he was. He, he knew when somebody was sick. He would look at him and make a decision. And that was awesome. I remember he walked up to somebody and he goes, he's got appendicitis. And I go, how do you know? He goes, just shut up and do what you're supposed to do. You learn. And he was right. He was right 90% of the time. Now, chief residence in surgery is a little different than chief residence in other things. But so that level of confidence is, was awesome. So, yeah, I don't have major regrets. I, the stereo. The stereo was a regret. I shouldn't have bought a double-deck, gigantic speakers with my student loan money. I had a hard time getting rid of it emotionally. Um. Can you speak on the atmosphere in medical school between people that are looking for competitive residencies after? Oh, actually, it was pretty collegial, I would say. We were very supportive of each other. It's not a, it's not a competition like getting into med school at all, because when you're trying to look for residencies, you're going all over the place. I mean, I, I'm from, I was in Virginia. I interviewed anywhere from Boston down to New Orleans, down to Texas, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, um, Maryland, Delaware. I mean, everything I could physically get to within reasonable expense. Um, but I remember I went to interview in Galveston and a group of us was going together and we kind of met. And remember, it's also when you're interviewing, you're in your beginning of your fourth year, you have a lot of free time. So we would meet and hang out. And, and a lot of my friends were like, although we're trying to get into the same residency, they were like, oh, this is, this is you. This is where you need to be because we knew each other so well. This is where you're going to be happy. And then we were, you know, pretty much 90% of people match. People that don't match, they do something weird. Maybe they aspiring beyond what they really should be aspiring to like if i decided to do dermatology i would have never matched um but uh, it was pretty collegial very happy for each other match day was crazy i think everybody matched except a very few people and then they go what's called non-categorical they go they start looking for transitional space that's a lot of terms you guys are going to learn later um but no it was pretty collegial we were pretty happy with it we partied like crazy after we all matched we partied for a long time Many weeks. And then you start your residency and life ends as you know. So could you talk a little bit more about rotations? What, which ones did you enjoy the most? Which one did you not? Just generally about rotations? So I think medical school is a little bit different now. Um, like I said, for me, my first year was in class. We never really left to do anything. Second year, they gave us some few external you know, kind of rotations. Completely lost. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, when you do, there are some mandatory rotations that you have to do in order for sit for part three. They're going to make you do those rotations, like internal medicine, surgery. Um, 
psycho psychiatry, OBGYN, there is, and they're they're just in there. The and they are they are all different. And you know, psych. Uh, I think I showed up about nine. I go to clinic, listen to people talk, ask the right question, present my patient. I used to be out by two o'clock. Internal medicine was nonstop. It was huge. It was brutal, but nothing like surgery. Surgery was pretty rough. Um, the you got it. You had few selections for what they would consider uh, elective stuff, but they were far and far in between. And um, it's a little different now with COVID. But you you know, I was trying to find out. Like when the, when the time came to do their extern, what they call externships, which is the uh, your elective selections, you wanted to go to places that you were hopefully match into. Like I want I went to um, Medical University of South Carolina because I wanted to go to residency there. I had a couple of friends there already, so I spent a month in Charleston, South Carolina, doing a rotation. Uh, I I spent a, a month in North Carolina, Greenville, North Carolina at the East uh, Carolina University. And so you have to make your selection of externships based on where you want to end up. And some residencies are more uh, competitive than others. For example, orthopedic surgery, you're going to do externships where uh, the orthopedic surgeons can look at you and decide if they want to keep you or not. Um, so uh, Durham is the same way. Those are so, so micro specialties like Durham and um, other ones are the same way. So you kind of make your selection. By the time you get to choose your externship, you kind of know what you want to do. You don't have a lot of time. Remember, the end of third year, externships, your match list has to go in. Your match is now, in March. So you have very little time to make those decisions and get your externships in. And then there's another question from the chat. What happens if you don't match? So the if you're not if you don't match you become non-categorical. So you try to find uh, transitional programs, and what happens is everybody who doesn't match is that like goes into a room. I guess now they all end up on the same Zoom. But what do you do? You start making phone calls, and your residency directors start making phone calls. There are manpower needs at uh, facilities, so each each program. Each residency program is allocated or allowed to graduate so many people at the end of their program. And that's decided by the American Board of Medical Specialty. They decide how many internal medicine people can finish, let's say, from Duke. I'm sure it's like something like 15. But they need more people than 15 the first year. So they pick up transitionals. They'll pick up four or five people that are guaranteed only one year to come in and work. In during that year, you work pretty hard trying to match into a, either start all over again as a first year or somebody's gonna get fired somewhere. Remember residency, like I said, I started with five, I finished with two. Three were left. So people came in in the middle, like we had people coming in during the second year, we had actually a guy come in during his third year. He kept on doing transitional spots until he got into a categorical spot. Categorical means that now you have a space for the boards. So there are, um, like I said, like that. And there are some specialties that are like, um, uh, like psychiatry, for example. You have to do an internship, and most people do what's called the internal medicine internship. So that's that's not a real ma they match in psychiatry, but it's a year later. It's not the following, day. and they spend one year doing an internship as a non-categorical, as a transitional year. And so um, then you, you, you keep on scrambling until you match. You want to match, let's put it that way. Let's see if I can see this map. It's funny, I can't see your chat. So anybody has any more questions, guys? Um, do you do much with the AMA or different groups outside of just working at your practice? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, absolutely. So a lot of those professional organizations and some of them are much more focused are really important for your practice. Even if you were in this hired, employed, I'm a member of the American College of Surgeons. I'm a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. 
I'm also a fellow of the American Society of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery. I do bariatric surgery. Um, a member of my uh, uh, county society, and then some a couple of other small societies. Most surgeons, general surgeons, are don't mingle in the AMA. Um, not nothing special about it. It's just one of those things that the meetings can be boring for us. We like to go to surgical meetings. Um, but no, you st you stay active in, for more reasons than one. I mean, a lot of times you get to meet your buddies that you went to school with in those meetings. And the other thing is that uh, there's a lot of resources, uh, continuing education, things like that, that I, I, can, I take advantage of. Um, so yeah, you, you want to stay fairly active. And you, you will find out that you really cannot isolate yourself. If you isolate yourself, like you say, I'm done. I don't need to do any more education. You will survive a few years only in practice and you'll kind of fade away. So your education never stops. We actually, we, we, within my group, we review articles. We argue with each other about argue, articles. We look at research. So we do that almost on a weekly basis. And if I find something interesting, I pass it on to my partners. Or they'll, they'll send me some picture of some articles they read. So that's ongoing. It's pretty, it's pretty much all the time. Um, I have a quick question. Um, what is your favorite part about being a doctor? Well, they get to call me doctor, which is pretty cool. It's funny, you can walk around and tell people to call you by first name and they can't do it. They just literally can't do it. So they call me doctor. Even, even people that I know really well, I work with, I tell them when I'm outside the hospital, don't call me doctor. They still can't do it. Um, is I, I think is the, the reality of it is, is you know, you, you're, you're held to a higher start standard. And that's, that's the emotional part. That's a philosophical part, that you are held to a higher standard. And you will meet that standard and you will strive to even surpass it. That's part one. The other part of it is, it's some cool shit. It's just cool. I can open somebody's stem to stern, fix them, put them back together, and go home at night. Now, you don't get to do that easy. It takes years to do that. It takes years not to shake and vomit in your own mask when you do that. But there are hundreds and hundreds of years of people before you. Um, and so, you know, the, there's, a, there's definitely a professional part that I love to do. Um, the other part of it is that is a unique thing that I have that is mine. My license to practice medicine is mine. And unless I do something real stupid, you can't take it away from me. Um, somebody else asked in the chat, what is the, do you think there's a, a better major to, um, to have an undergrad that will help you more in med school? Oh, I, you know, I, being a science major definitely helps. Um, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think the people that have different majors, I mean, I had a guy who came to med school in my class. He was an Air Force pilot, graduated, finished his uh, uh, Air Force commitment, decided to go to med school. I think you just have to be very organized. You have to be diligent with your study. And I think that's what makes a difference in getting to med school and staying in med school. You could be the, you know, the smartest science guy in your college and probably make a shitty doctor, but the, um, you have to be very, they have to be organized and diligent. Um, so you can go through things fast. But remember doctors are not the smartest people around. Usually the PhDs are smarter than we are, but the, we have a different knack. Uh, we can walk into a room and talk to people. So I think whatever you do in college, do it well. Um, and also I take advantage, remember time is limited. That's the hardest thing for me that I had a really hard time with is that when you're in college, you really don't think you have time. You guys got more time. That is unbelievable. You remember, I did two years of graduate. That's at med school. In med school, we did two years of graduate biochemistry in six weeks. They literally went through the entire biochem book in six weeks. I don't even know why we had books. Nobody got a chance to read the damn things. But you have to, you cannot repeat like study over and over again. You can't 
you don't have the time to sit there and go, okay, I'm going to review this again tomorrow. And you just got to learn it right then and then. And so that was one thing that I had a hard time with. I got to the point where I started practicing, reading something and learning it right then and then. I didn't have a chance to go back. I, do, I used to make little note cards for the real crazy stuff that I couldn't remember. Um, there's this thing called the brachial plexus. It's a collection of nerves down here. Nobody knows it. Nobody. Everybody has got a little poem for it or, or some kind of word for it. I used to make a note card for that. But the, um, you have to become efficient at what you do. First, you want to graduate. Don't go into a major. You can't graduate. You can't go into med school if you don't graduate. So don't go to biochem if you're not good at it. Just go for biology or basic chemistry or psychiatry, something like that. Psychology, I guess. MCATs are key. You got to pass the MCATs one. And you have to interview well. You can't be, you have to be um, likable to the school that interviews you. You guys read the chat thing because I can't read it. I don't even know how to. Okay, there's one. I don't think the guests can see it. So that's probably oh. why, since you're not a part of the organization. But it says, um, "What is one of your most memorable cases or experiences that made you know you picked the right profession?" Oh, see, as a medical student, you only spend so much time. Like my time in surgery was two four-week rotations. One was surgical oncology, where I really met the guy who let me decide I wanted to be a surgeon. And the other one was plastic surgery. It was easy as shit. It was awesome. But my most memorable experience were my, as a resident. One of my favorite one was uh, East Texas has a, a bunch of lumber yards. And there was a period of time that uh, people that didn't want trees to be cut would put nails in the tree so your they, their saw would break you learn all kinds of weird things when you're a resident and they had a piece of they had a big lump piece of lumber inside this big saw machine and the saw grabbed the nail and shot out a piece of lumber a two by four and he went across another a guy that was down the line and the two by four took his left kidney and took it out and he was brought into a hospital with a lump piece of lumber sticking out of him uh, from left to right, he was coming in all the way across. He was laying in bed with a two by four going across from him, and uh, we operated on him that night. He did go home eventually, and I still remember the pieces of kidney hanging out from the piece of lumber. Um, there were cases like that. I've seen gunshot wounds to the face, uh, gunshot wound to the right upper quadrant, which is right above you. That's a, one of the worst places to get shot. The things you will learn when you do a residency, the things they teach you about, crazy stuff like that, is the rules of trauma, the rules of um, what they call damage control, battlefield trauma, which is crazy stuff, um, blast injuries, electrical injuries, all that stuff was just amazing to me. I mean, I used to be exhausted, but I was like, oh, I remember there was an explosion in Texas City. Over 100 people got hurt. They got life flighted in. We were all deck at hand hands of deck and forget to call it man it was nuts we we literally finally got some food and some i remember they gave us gatorade to drink but those are memorable experiences i guess uh i remember there was a shooting between cops and robbers but again that's what i like i'm a surgeon so i like those things um and when you're doing your rotations i remember also um one case when i was a, res a medical student I was on an internal medicine, but I was on a med, psych med rotation, which is a psychiatrist that specializes in internal medicine. And they brought this lady in who everybody thought was crazy. She had been arrested. She had been drug tested. She was a professional, had lost her job. They took her kids away from her. And then this guy, this doctor that was uh, my, my they call him the attending. It was my attending. Smart guy. He spent a lot of time interviewing her. Then he ordered some tests. And these were the days before everybody had an MRI. But eventually we found out she had a frontal lobe tumor and it was changing her personality. And she was a normal person that was criminalized because of a tumor in her frontal lobe. So crazy, right? Think about that. Unfortunately, they couldn't save her. But he explained this woman's behavior. Like I said, she was arrested for shoplifting. They thought she was drunk. They thought she was doing alcohol. She wasn't doing any of that. 
So that's one of my memorable cases because it, it was it was sad, but it was thinking that somebody's personality could be so deranged because of a tumor in their frontal lobe. I'm sure most of you guys know guys, usually boys, that have frontal lobe issues. It may be a tumor. You never know. It may be just, just not have a tumor. But anyway, that, those are memorable cases. And I have a lot of them. I can tell you stories forever. Okay, we'll probably we'll probably do like one or two more and then we'll let you go. Uh, one is, what did you look for when you were picking a place of residency? Uh, it's interesting because you, uh, so this is really important. When it's time to pick your residency, and this is the, the part that most people have a hard time understanding, is most likely you will end up working where you did your residency, not where your medical school was and not where you're from. Because when you're in residency is where you make a lot of contacts. So majority of people end up in careers near their residency. I mean, I'm from Virginia and I live in Texas. And so um, you don't, don't pick a residency because of where you're gonna live though. You wanna pick a residency because you are going to, after residency is where the competition starts. Like you're right now, you're trying to compete to get into med school. There's so many spots in med school. It's a different type of competition. When you finish your residency and you want to get a job, you want to come out well trained, so you can be on your own. You can be independent. You're going to be. You're not going to have attendings anymore. You're not going to have chief residents. You're on your own. So pick your residency based on the best training you can get. Um, and by the time you go start interviewing, you'll know what the best trainings are. For that specialty, and then there is uh, is also the you know where you're comfortable at. I mean, I I knew when I interviewed in Boston that hell no, it was too damn cold. I would have died. And then two weeks later, I'm in Galveston and it's like 70 degrees. I'm like, okay, this is where I'm going to start ranking. They were both good programs, are nationally known programs. But I was like getting up at five, you know, I, I started my rounds at 5 a.m. when I was a resident to get up at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. to walk in the snow. It just didn't, it wasn't appealing to me. Um, so part of that was also how, how, where can I be to manage my life as, as a resident? Um, a lot of people wanted to go to Boston. They're used to it. They live up there. They're, they're cool with that. I just wasn't. But pick your residency based on where you can get the best training or what you want to be. Um, and there's also this other thing. If you're going to do a subspecialty afterwards, for example, you want to be, do orthopedic trauma, which is its own specialty. Orthopedic trauma, you don't want to go to a residency program that's in a private hospital that don't have a trauma program. You're not going to get into a, what's it called, a fellowship, a trauma fellowship. You want to go to a major facility that has a big trauma program so you can do some orthopedic trauma. And then when you finish your orthopedic residency, you have something to talk about so you can get into the orthopedic trauma fellowship. So um, you don't want to do a, a residency in surgery in a place where they don't have surgical oncology if you want to become a surgical oncologist. So you kind of have to kind of start making decisions. But all of that stuff will happen to you uh, probably third year, end of third year of med school. That's when all, most of these decisions are made. It's a long way, isn't it? It's okay. It'll go fast. You will learn things nobody else knows how to do. All right. Anybody else got one more before we go? No. Okay, I'll ask one really quick. Um, what do you what do you think is like the the hardest part of having to overcome like the emotional aspect of your job, like uh, like relationships with patients, and since you're in such like a, I guess what could be a risky position, like overcoming uh, when things go wrong, or that kind of thing. Sure. Actually, when you're in med school, they at least with us even thirty years ago. They spent some time with us to talk to us about that. I remember teaching us rules or how, like how you interview a patient 
try to be empathetic, but not sympathetic. You need to show empathy, but not sympathy. Um, you need to make sure that you are uh, unbiased. Uh, you have to be very, you have to, you're a scientist first, but you're still a human being. So some of those tools prepare you for those events, like talking to somebody about they're going to die. And just like that, you talk to them and you say, you're about to die, you know, so, but you can't like, be obnoxious. You have to have, you have to show empathy. So there are certain skills and certain tools that they will teach you how to have those conversations and how to go about preparing yourself for those conversations. And then believe it or not, we actually have a whole bunch of committees that deal with our own well-being. Um, like during COVID crisis, a lot of our intensivists, intensivists are the guys who run the ICU, the pulmonologists mostly. I mean, they saw death. There were like six, seven deaths a day during the surges. Um, you have to learn to allow yourself to be emotionally free. So if you need to cry, you go cry. If you need to take a break and go get some fresh air, you do. You tell your friends, you tell your partners, you tell your co colleagues, hey, I need a break. I need to get out of here. Um, but the um, you cannot let it overtake you. The hardest thing you're going to find, and I still struggle with it, is not to bring it home. And it's funny, I don't bring it home, then my wife, she sometimes gets mad at me because she goes, you don't talk about it. I'm like, wait a minute. I was told not to bring it home and you want me to talk about it. But so, but I have colleagues, people at work that I I do that freely. So you will find ways to let yourself take a break emotionally, mentally. Um, but you're not allowed to take that break with your patients. They don't deserve that. For them, they're the one. For you, it may be number 10. But to them, they are the one. So when you talk about statistics with patients, you say, oh, there's a 30% chance of dying and you're the 30%. They don't care about that. That They are the 100%. They're about to die. So they will teach you skills uh, of how you interview, how you talk to people, how to show empathy and, you know, be, be listen, be quiet and listen to the patient uh, and learn from them. And sometimes the craziest thing is when you listen to some patients, you learn if you, you just go, oh, my God, they actually said something that I really was important. So um, you still kind of, uh, you know, you go back next day. The guys are the hardest times are battlefield physicians. They, they have a hard time, um, but they also allow, they have tools and things for them to take breaks uh, and kind of cope with that. And if you think about it, if you decide you want to be an oncologist, you got to be good at this. I mean, oncology is just one of those fields. It's just, just the way it is. But they, they, they'll teach you. They'll teach you tools. You'll gain them those tools. And there are some people that are not good at it, so they're going to dermatology. And there are people that love doing it, and they're going to oncology. All right. I think that's all we got. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, letting us ask you so many questions. It's okay. Uh, you guys are free to go, and we will see you on the 24th. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.